Talk Show. Recorded live. Test, test, one, two, three. Check, check, one, two. Welcome, everyone, to this Wednesday, March 26, 2014 edition of Money, Banking, and Trust by Moving Titles and Commerce. I'm your host, Christian Walters. Welcome to NTT as New Trust Technology. Welcome to the revival of the study of equity, its principles, doctrines, and rules of equity in opposition to the tendency of giving an undue prominence and a superiority to purely legal rules, and ignoring, forgetting, or the suppression of equitable notions. Welcome to a crier in the wilderness. Welcome to repent for the Lord's kingdom and its enforcement is near. Left off on John Norton Conway's third volume, Equity Jurisprudence on section 1102, that's page 455 in the PDF or page 2548 in the book, section 1102. First, take notice and acknowledgement with agreement that this show under documents is a private confidential arrangement not to be construed or relied upon as being legal advice for an individual legal situation or employed for making a legal decision. You will not use any of this information for making a legal decision or performing a legal procedure and is not a substitute for legal advice and or guidance by a licensed attorney. This private show and our documents are for academic and informational purposes only to be used at your own risk without liability to Christian Walters. By accessing or reviewing this show or using the documents therein, you understand with agreement that with all rights reserved, without prejudice, Christian Walters is not an attorney licensed to practice law in the state of Florida or any other state, and has not given legal advice or accepted fees for legal advice, provided no assistance, advising, or guidance of any kind for use by non-attorneys or pro se parties in preparation or use of herein reference. There is no interest in any use reference therein and is not a party to this or any action arising from and is only acting as an authorized capacity as liaison's communications between the parties. By reading and or using this information, you acknowledge and agree you are not a client of Christian Walters. Documents and or show recordings are incomplete and void without this notice agreement being attached to and by reference and a breach of this agreement. Upon breach of this agreement, the breaching party becomes liable for commercial damages of $200 million or more per stultification or impairment per Christian Walters' discretion. Thank you for your understanding. Now for what equity really is, and I can think of no better quote to go to as John Bouvier's out of the Institutes of American Law, 1882, Volume 2, Section 3724, Paragraph 4, which states that Law is nothing without equity, and equity is everything, even without law. Those who perceive what is just and what is unjust only through the eyes of law never see it as well as those who behold it with the eyes of equity. Law may be looked upon in some manner as an assistance for those who have weak perception of right and wrong. Useful for those who are short-sighted or whose visual organs are deficient. Equity in its true and genuine meaning is the soul and spirit of the law, Law is construed, and rational law is made by it. John Bouvier, Institutes of American Law, 1882, Volume 2, Section 3724, Paragraph 4. So remember, it doesn't matter 
how many people don't believe it? what matters is whether it's true or not. So now on to public versus private definition, which is kind of like my pet peeve of why people aren't getting what really is private, because really they got the wrong definition. They think things are all private. It's the other way around. Everything's all public. You've got to do something specially to form a private relation. So we need a definition. The definition I use is private is any relation that you apply or express, which is your intent as a special one. Next question is, when did you ever express any intent to form any relation as a special one? The answer to that is never. So consequently, all your relations are then all public by default. You just don't know and understand that. You have to do something special. What, what is this special relation that we're talking about? You have to do something specifically specially to claim it's a private relation. You just can't say this is a private relation. It just doesn't work that way. Something has to be done specially. And that's what NTT is here all to explain about, how to form a special private relation. The special private relation then is the private. So normally everybody thinks that the private conversation you have across the fence with your neighbor in your backyard is a private conversation. No, it's not. It's all public. You did nothing specifically special to make it a private relation. You've got to form a private trust. And how do you do that? That's what we're all here about, NTT. New Trust Technology teaches you how to form a private trust and how to administer it, how to enforce it. And all that is under one jurisdiction outside the ad law jurisdiction, outside admiralty, outside common law, outside statutes and codes. It's a other law form outside of regular decisional law. That's equity. There's a lot of confusion about, oh, I don't want equity. That's the thing that's hammering to me. Yes, that's true. Equity is the enforcement for all law jurisdictions, whether it be admiralty, whether it be common law, or whether it be statutes and codes, or whatever it is. The enforcement of all those separate jurisdictions, which, by the way, they all rest at law or in the public, all the enforcement of all those public jurisdictions is equity. But equity has today what they say is a separate jurisdiction all to itself, it goes by a different rule set, different principle, and the outcomes are different. And that's where your substantive rights are today, and that's where you want to be. And if you're not in equity through a private trust, and that's how you get into equity, through a private trust, that's the easiest way. If you're not in a private trust that's administered in equity, then you're an at-law, and at-law, you have no rights. You're the defendant. Stinking defendants have no rights. They're there on a D.C. contract, and D.C. law is going to get you, and the enforcement is going to come and hammer you in a foreclosure or whatever, and it's going to come at you through equity. So you might say that equity is being used as the force for these other jurisdictions, but you shouldn't be in those jurisdictions to begin with. Because if you're in that jurisdiction, you're in there as a fiction, and you're acting as a fiction. And if you're a fiction, then you're subject to the laws of that realm. And really, that's the playpen because so many things are being done for you that in that realm, that public realm, because you yourself don't know how to do it yourself. And it has to be done for you. You're the ward, and you just don't know it. And you think you're an adult, and you're 50 years old, but you still don't know how to conduct business as the king. You don't know one thing about your jurisdiction. You don't know one thing about your correct form and procedure and process that has to be administered to get you in there. You're caught without 
one iota of a knowledge of anything. So how could you be a king? You must still be a little immature kid that's under the tutelage of someone else, the guardianship, until you grow up as king and know how to administer your realm properly. The fact that you don't do it right proves to me and others that you're not who you say you are. So remember, again, it doesn't matter how many people don't believe it. What matters is whether it's true or not. So you're never forming any special relations to claim any substantive rights because it's the subject matter of what's being heard and the relation as to which jurisdiction can hear it that makes all the difference. So consequently, all your relationships are then all public, which comes to the doctrine of election that the thing that you choose on a multiple choice items, the two or more, the thing that you choose substitutes for all the rest, or you waive all the rest. So how do I prove the intent that this is a special relation? By the record. So if you're not creating any records, if you're formed a special private relationship, a, a private trust, then you don't have the intent demonstrated that it was your intent to form anything private. So it's the records that controls. It's the manifestation of intention that controls the records. That takes us to the case LGBA Belleville Farms, 2011 case, out of the courts of special appeals of Maryland. In other words, this is out of the equity side of the court. Special appeals. Talking about Austin Wakeland Scott Law and Trust, Section 2.8, which states that it is to be noticed that an express trust may arise even though the parties in their own mind did not intend to create a trust. How easy it is to get somebody in trust. So that comes back to the trust law that says no party in a trust needs to know the trust is being formed. Restatement second, Law and Trust, whatever restatement. It's all the same thing. No party in a trust needs to tr no, know a trust is being formed. So if you don't know everything's all a trust, well, then how easy, easy it is to you to get stuck in a contract. By default, everything looks like a contract unless you express it to be something else. And you never express it to be anything else other than a contract. In fact, you create nothing but records of contract. And you got no records created of anything other in another jurisdiction, say private trust, inequity. It is to be noticed that an express trust may arise even though the parties in your own mind did not intend to create a trust. It is the manifestation of intention that controls. I keep on coming back to the same stuff all the time. Manifestation of intention that controls. What is the manifestation of intention? Well, that's your actions or your deeds written down on a piece of paper, recording what you did, your actions. That's a record. So it's the record that controls. And what does the record demonstrate? A private trust. And if it doesn't, if the records don't demonstrate a private trust, then you've got a D.C. contract that's being enforced in legal land and I'm afraid you're probably defendant and going to lose. Back in the text, it says an express trust may be created even though the parties do not call it a trust. And here's the kicker, even though they do not understand precisely what a trust is. How easy is it to get somebody in a trust? It says it is sufficient of what they appear to have to mind is in its essentials what the courts mean when they speak of a trust which takes us to the trust test of the courts. The elements necessary to prove a trust, which would prove your intent, that it would be something other than a D.C. enforceable contract with different rights. Now, 
Now, for the common law folks out there, out of the origins of English equity, Adams, in his book, wrote that we may confidently assert that equity and common law originated in one and the same procedure, and that during the first 200 years of their history, they were not distinguished from one another. And that's the problem today. They're still not distinguished from one another, even though it's been explained, if you do the research, that they are separate. And what you think you know is giving you the wrong conclusions. Here you don't think you want equity. No. Equity is just the enforcement of the common law. Equity is what created the common law. Equity is the foundation that created all jurisdiction, all law. Remember the Adams quote I just read? Excuse me, Bouvier's quote, I mean. Where it says in Bouvier's quote that the law is nothing without equity, and equity is everything, even without law. It says that Equity is the soul and spirit of the law. Positive law is construed. Positive law is construed. And rational law is made by it. Rational law is made by it. Well, what would that that was made? What is that? Common law? Statutes and codes? Admiralty? What made it? Equity. There's where your substantive rights are. Why are you going to go into a court of equity and for trying to enforce substantive rights? You ain't got no substantive rights there. That's the wrong subject matter for that jurisdiction. And then you wonder why you don't get your rights heard. You wonder why you got hammered. Here it is. You just didn't know. You're in the wrong jurisdiction for the subject matter to be heard there. You need to be in a court of equity enforcing a private trust. And then you blame them for your own ignorance. Oh, they're all treasonous. They ignored all my documents of all my private rights in there. <laughs> you fool you. We've all been fools, including myself. You know, I used to think the same way. I don't think that way anymore. I'm the one that's at fault. I gotta remove the plank out of my own eye so I can see clearly. The, remove, the, remove the speck out of my brother's. That's the problem. We're quick to judge, quick to anger. No, you need to be slow to anger, slow to speak. You need to agree with your adversary quickly because you're in the wrong jurisdiction. Remember, the first 200 years of your history, they were not distinguished from one another. And now if we do distinguish between them, during that period, we do it artificially by the application of tests impossible to contemporaries. It's well on to the 14th century before we get any clear distinction between equity and common law. They're distinct. They're separate. Hutchinson versus Maxi Center case says it still, even though there's one civil action and process and procedure, it's still two separate jurisdictions. Still two separate jurisdictions. With a rule set that they're governed by or adjudicated upon that are the opposite. That, my friends, is the conflict. And any time you plead a conflict, between law and equity, equity always wins. That's how easy it is to win. By default, all the time, if you had pleaded properly the conflict, you would automatically win. They got to go with the equity jurisdiction. It's like if you do nothing or you do everything wrong, you can expect no other outcome than the outcome that you've received in at law. You will be foreclosed upon. You will be penalized. But yeah, in the other jurisdiction, in equity, equity hates a forfeiture. Equity hates a penalty. 
And if you would plead the two rules uh, that they're being determined, at law versus equity, and that that is a conflict, equity always wins. Section 1102, Pomeroy's Volume 3, page 455. 1102, the same, what words are sufficient? No particular form of words is necessary in order to vest property in a married woman for her separate use. There it is again, right there. No particular words are necessary to form a trust. And a use is what a trust is. But do you have records to say it's a use or a trust? If you don't, you don't have one. can't prove it, even if you did. I don't have enough skills to invoke the right court to get it in there because you follow the way everybody else does things. You're going to put it right in the ad law jurisdiction. So they're going to treat everything as a contract. Whether it's admiralty, whether it's civil, whether it's common law, or whatever law there is, it's all the wrong jurisdiction. Real men and women with substantive rights need to be in a court of equity. If they're in any other court, than that, they're in D.C. land, they're in legal land, where you shouldn't be because that's where all the fictions are. If that's where you're at, you're acting like the fiction. Plain and simple. No particular form of words is necessary in order to vest property in a married woman for her separate use and to thus create a separate estate. Back to that one show that I did. How are you holding your estate? How are you holding your titles? In what estate are you holding your titles? Back in the text, the intention to do so, although not expressed in terms, may be inferred from the nature of the provisos annexed to the gift. Wow. <laughs> the intention however, must be clear and unequivocal, not merely to confer the use upon the wife for her benefit, but also to exclude the husband. The doctrine was very concisely and accurately stated by Vice Chancellor Mallins in the recent case, quote, there must be in a will or in any other instrument an intention shown that the wife shall take and that the husband shall not. Footnote one. The decision upon the particular expressions are very numerous and somewhat diff, uh, conflicting. Oh, well, remember, anytime you've got a conflict between equity and that law, you got equity always wins. Somewhat conflicting. A comparison of the cases, it would seem that the American courts have been more liberal than the English in giving effect to language. Effect to language. Yeah, what's that mean? They've got different jurisdictions as to the meanings of applying the same particular word in the jurisdiction, which means something in another jurisdiction. The same word, different meaning. So you've got everything at law going by certain terms that they recognize over there, but the very same word in equity means something totally different. Wow, what a code. Break that code. Know the secret decoder language. Oh, we just switched meanings over here in jurisdiction and equity. Oh, it means something totally different. An asset means something else in equity than it does at law. Wow, that must be special. Back in the text, I have placed in the footnote some 
examples of words held to be sufficient and those held to be insufficient. Footnote 2. It says in the footnote, expressions held sufficient to create a separate estate. It will be seen that some of the early English decisions upon the word sole use have been overruled. For her sole use and disposal, quote unquote, see Bland versus Dawes, sole benefit in Green versus Britain, and for her own sole use and benefit, absolutely. And in read Carsley's trust, sole use, a lot of cases here supporting these different quotes here, for her use, independent of her husband, for her use and benefit upon, independent of any other person, for her own use at her own disposal. Bottom, bottom, all the way down, all the way down. Cases to support every one of them. Clear down, there's bunches of them. Section 1103, what property is included? Property of an, any kind, real or personal, in other words, all collateral, and any interest therein may be conveyed, settled, or held to the wife's separate use, wife's separate estate. Her equitable separate estate may therefore include estates in fee in land, in possession or reversion, life estates, estates for years, things in action, securities, specific chattels, or money. So where a wife has a separate estate, the rent, income, and profits thereof are, of course, her separate property. And if the savings of such an income are invested by her and the investment is so made, will also be her separate property. And in general, when the land or the property is purchased by or on behalf of the wife and with proceeds of her separate estate, it becomes impressed with the same character. Wife's earnings may also, by the absence of her husband, be her separate property. While equity thus provides a separate property for a wife fee from the control of her husband, still she may also deal with it as those whose will uh, lose that character. If the wife acting without any undue influence expressly authorized or tacitly permit her husband to receive the income of the uh, of her separate property and apply it to his own uses and proposes, uh, purposes, or to receive it and apply it in the benefit of the family, it will thereby cease to be her separate property and because his becomes his, shall uh, she she can never recall it nor claim any reimbursement. Section eleven oh four her power of disposition. The general doctrine long settled by the English courts of chancery is that a femme covert acting in respect to her separate property is competent to act in all respects as if she were a femme sole. Among these instances of substantial ownership is the just despondent die, which is uh, possessed and may be exercised by the married woman without her husband's consent unless the instrument creating the separate estate contains strict uh, restrictions upon the power. It's all about the powers and authorities given in the indenture by the grantor. The grantor controls everything. If you don't know you're a grantor, you grant under a general deposit and you're not the grantor. You lose control of all the assets that you grant because it's considered all legal. And under the legal, you have no comebacks to say anything because you've given total title to the legal land. But under a special deposit, under a trust, you're the beneficiary, say, as well as the grantor or somebody else is the beneficiary, another third party. And what you deposited or granted was to be used with a duty. Now you got a trust. Trust law applies a different rule set than the ad law. 
and you got some kind of comebacks if you wrote it in the indenture when you granted it. If you made yourself a co-beneficiary along with somebody else, say, for example, you could function as grantor and co-beneficiary. Now you got beneficial rights, or you wrote in the powers that you granted, the beneficiary has the right to restrict or change or modify the trust. So these separate estates contain restrictions upon the power. Power of who? Power of the trustee, the power of the authority that was granted the trustee, the duty. Back in the text, it is therefore well settled that so far as the separate estates embraces personal property, money, chattels, things and actions, chattels, real, rents, and profits of lands, although no power of disposition is given to her in express terms, she may dispose of it as though she were unmarried by acts inter vivos or by will. For the separate estate embraces land, the wife's power of disposition over her life estate therein has never been doubted, and her contracts to sell or to mortgage such life estates has always been specifically <clears throat> enforced against her with respect to estates and fee settled or held to her separate use. There had formerly been some doubt arising from conflicting authorities. Uh, what would be the conflicting authorities? There's two different jurisdictions. Now, why are they always in conflict, conflict? Why are they always conflicting? Because the legal always goes by a different rule set and comes up with a different conclusion than what equity was, because it uses it, the maxims, equity maxims, is what equity comes to the conclusions or or adjudications upon. And if there's two different rule sets, you get two different conclusions, two different adjudications, you got a conflict. It comes a conflict between equity and at law. At law loses. Equity always wins. Why is that? Because it's the primary thing. It's the priority. It's the foundation that all other laws should be reflecting. And if those laws are reflecting equity, then equity doesn't have to do anything because it's reflecting equity. But if it's not, it'll go around it. Equity always follows the law. What is the law that it follows? Itself, equity, the maxims. Not by anything different. So if the other jurisdictions are not using the maxims, are they not conflicts? If they're not using the same principles, and then they can't be true laws, then equity will step in and come up with some other kind of decree. Back in the text, the general rule is now established, however, that the wife's power of disposition as a femme soul extends to estates and fee and lands as fully as to the life estates or to personal property. You know, today, everything is like real or personal. Well, what's real property? Today, they define it as being land. Well, what's personal property? Everything is not land, <laughs> whether corporal or incorporal. But all those things could be classified as one, collateral. Collateral can be the res, no matter what it is. Res is in trust. Learning this different reasoning process, this way of threading things together, understanding with different understanding, different meanings, and to recognize the separation or the segregation of two different jurisdictions. And you can put all the law forms today into one grouping and call it at law. All the different jurisdictions other than equity, put them all in one thing, put them in legal land. If you look at it that way, you got a container, one bucket, 
with all those different jurisdictions, no matter what they call it, admiralty, common law, statutes and codes, they're all in one bucket. That's one jurisdiction set, one grouping, one class. Then you've got another bucket, equity. That's the way you need to look at it. That's, that's the way you need to segregate it. And when you have the understanding of that, of those two buckets, that they're set up that way, now you can start applying these meanings. But if you go to Black's Law, I don't care what edition, they always have multiple meanings of words. One, two, three, four, you know. Well, all these different definitions, each one is for a separate jurisdiction. It's up to you to figure out which ones are which. Figure out which one applies to equity and then group the rest of them in the other bucket. And now this stuff will start making sense to you. Cracking the code. It ain't what's been cracked before because what they thought, they're stuck in the one bucket. They're cracking the code in the one bucket. Well, there's this other bucket. The real code to crack is the relationship between the two buckets. When you got that down, you got the whole ball of wax. You got the pot of gold. Like having piranhas, goldfish in the same bucket. You got everything all mixed up. The goldfish are being eaten by the piranhas. Because you think that goldfish and piranhas are all in one bucket. Oh, well, here inside that bucket, there's a division down that bucket, plastic divider, and there's goldfish on the right in equity, and then there's piranhas in the left in legal. We asked the attorney one time, you know, how do you do what you do? Why do you take everything? The answer was, because we can. So is it right that you take all the equities in the property, equity being that word that means one thing at law, and equity means another thing in equity. Because so everybody thinks equity at law, by definition, is the difference as a money value between how the debt that you owed minus the equity in the house, which leaves whatever's left over as to be your equitable interest. In a dollar amount. But equity doesn't look at it as a dollar amount. We'll look up equitable assets in Black's Law. And you'll find out that's a difference between that and a legal asset. Big difference. They're 180 degrees apart, it's like black and white, it's like night and day. Back in the text, it seems to have been formally supposed that the difference exists in the wife's power for alienation and or disposition between the case where the property is actually held by trustees to her separate use and the case where the property is conveyed directly to herself for her soul and separate use. All notion of any such difference has been abrogated, and the same power of disposition belongs equally to both these conditions or forms of the separate estate. As an incidental to her general power of disposition, unless she is expressly restrained from anticipation, a married woman renders her separate property liable for a breach of trust by her trustees in which she is incurred and for the breach of trust which she herself commits.
breach of trust which she herself commits. We're always sure misconstrued construed to be trustees, breaching the, our own trust because we don't know any different. We don't even know or understand the trust. Next section, 1105, her power in this country. Such being the rules concerning the wife's just despondi, as now settled in England, I shall next inquire how far these or other rules have been adopted by the courts of various American states. One or two preliminary observations would be very important in determining the present condition of the law upon this subject or in our own country. In the first place, in the very many of the states under modern statutes where property is conveyed or given to the wife directly, she now takes a full separate legal estate therein, wholly free from the interest and claims of the husband and has over it the power of disposition given by the statute, number one, footnote, anti-section 1199, note two, in many states the statutory power is absolute, although she is, uh, as she were, unmarried. Back in the text, the second place in New York where the other states which have adopted the same type by legislation, where land is given to the trustees upon an express trust for the benefit of the married woman, the city key trust, acquires no estate in the trust property, and she is prohibited from alienating, uh, leaning, charging, or binding her own interest. Footnote 2, anti section 1003 through 1005. Express trust in personal property and the separate use of wives seems to be left under the operation of the doctrines of equity. All family matters are in equity. Back in the text, with regard to the main question concerning the wife's power of disposition, there is such a divergence of opinion among the American decisions that it would be very difficult, if not in fact impossible, to formulate any general rule as established by their authority. But note three. that indeed in some instances it would be difficult to task to reconcile the decisions made by the courts of the same state. In several of the states, the courts seem to have regarded the wife's separate property instead of rendering her a femme sole with respect to its use as depriving her of all rights of ownership except the single one of enjoying, enjoying its income. And these judges have forgotten that the nominal ownership without any of the rights incident to ownership without the power of leaning, managing, or in any way binding the property, is in real uh, reality no ownership. A wife holding a so-called separate estate, but whose hands are tied and who is completely debarred from dealing with it, from obtaining credit upon it, and from using it in the affairs of life, is actually in a worse position than the wife under the operation of common law rules, whose property is subject to the control and disposition of her husband. Yeah, now why is that? Well, we've got the wrong interpretations we're using, the broad and the narrow. Narrow would be using no interpretation with any substance or maxims in its use. You're going to come up with a, an at-law definition that's going to cut out the wife, say, or an application of anything else. But with the broad interpretation, which is going to be based on the equity maxims, you'll come to the right conclusion. You know, really, there is no separate law other than the law of equity. Equity has its judgment side, which could be classified as statutes and codes, but it's just for judgment. And the judgment is because you weren't living an equitable life. In other words, your life wasn't run by the equity maxims. You're being hit with a judgment, a statute and code because of that. That should be the only use of a statute and code, not this other stuff that comes up with this that's not 
pertaining to the equitable meaning, which is the foundation of which the statutes and codes are built. And the statutes and code judgment is nothing more than a signpost pointing you back to go back to equity. It's hitting you in the head with a two-by-four. Get out of here. You don't belong here. You're not doing equity. Go back and do equity. The letter of law kills you. The statute and code kills you. But by grace you live. And grace comes out of equity. Because equity is the God-mind consciousness, the will of God, which is fair, just, and right, which is what everybody wants in common law. And here it is in common law is what you want. You want what's fair, just, and right. That's equity, folks. That's not common law. Now, today there may be some laws that reflect equity, what's fair, just, and right. Then there was, those would be equitable judgment laws. But the problem is today we don't have what's fair, just, and right in the enforcement of the laws. And remember, the first maxim, he who comes into equity must be doing equity. And what that means is you got to recognize that the other party has equitable rights too. So what equitable rights are you presenting? How do you present them? Because you've got to be plaintiff. Defendants don't have any rights. You've got to be plaintiff. Plaintiff sets jurisdiction. Defendants don't. If you're caught up as a defendant on an at-law contract being enforced because of the breach of the contract, you need to be hammered. Because you're not coming in with an independent action suing for any kind of equitable rights that are counter to the contract. Remember executory contracts in Section 366 and 367 in Pomeroy. If you don't understand executory contracts, you got a ways to go yet. Executory contracts really being two separate trusts, always operating in a pair instead of being one DC contract on just one side because you didn't express it to be a trust. You don't understand it to be two separate trusts. Legal land only sees the one trust as being a contract. Equity looks at it as being two contracts, uh, two trusts, really. It may be doubtful whether in any single state and all the conclusions reached by the English courts have been accepted without limitation or modification. The American states have been broadly separated into two generic classes. The decisions which mark the existence of the classes differ not in any matters of detail, but in the underlying principle. Yeah, it's always the underlying principle. And what are the principles or the principia of the jurisdiction you're in? And it better be reflecting equity. If not, you're definitely in the wrong jurisdiction. You're in fiction land. Back in the text in the first class, the courts have accepted the principle of the English doctrine, and they regard the wise just despondi as resulting from the fact that the equitable separate estate over which he is, partially at least a femme soul, and not as resulting from the permissive provisions of the instrument creating such separate estate. It follows, therefore, where the instrument creating the separate estate imposes no express restrictions and that the wife has general power of disposing or charging it, and even though no such authority is in terms conferred, this power of disposition, however, does not generally extend to the corpus of the land held for her separate use and fee, and it is confined to personal property, the rents and profits of the lands, and perhaps to her life estate in land. States composing the second class, the courts have widely departed from the principle of the English doctrine. They regard the wife's power over separate estates as resulting and not to the existence of an equitable separate estate itself, but from the permissive provisions of the instrument creating such a state. And they have accordingly adopted the general uh, rule that a married woman 
has only these powers of disposing or charging her separate property, which are expressly or by necessary construction conferred upon her in the instrument conveying the property or con creating the trust. And then determining the extent of these powers, the terms of the instrument are to be strictly construed. Section 1106, disposition under a power of appointment. If a married woman has a life estate and property to her separate use and is also clothed with the general power of appointment over the corpus of the property, which the default of the appointment of her goes to other persons and she exercises the power, the appointed property is not thereby made applicable to the payment of her debts, excepting only those which are fraudulent, that is, her liabilities arising from fraud. When the justice bondi is conferred by means of a power, that is, when the wife has only a life estate to her separate use with power to appoint the principal of the fund or the corpus of the property, she can only dispose of such capital or corpus through an ex execution of a power by an appointment. Footnote 2. As if the power authorized an appointment by deed, its execution by her may be immediate during her lifetime. If by will only, then the disposition cannot take effect until after her death. It's to support that. Ah, the power of the will. My will or a dead will? based on the one whose will it is. Is the person still alive, administering their will? Or is the person actually dead, administering their written will? I'm not talking about fiction. I'm talking about live, real people. Because the fictions reside in another jurisdiction called that law. I'm talking about the live people solely in equity. They have no need for the fiction law. Need for fiction law because they're not in fiction land, subject to the statutes and codes of fiction. They run by principle. They invoke jurisdiction in equity courts. They're solely in the private because they operate in a private trust. Nobody knows because it's all private. They did know somehow the trust got breached by the primary parties or by you trespassing. Section 1107, restraint upon anticipation. The large powers of dealing with her separate property as though were her single, as though she were single, thus given to the wife by the English courts of equity, tended in some degree to defeat the very object from which the separate estate is created. Now let's go back to the English courts of equity. In 1776, equity and all the laws in this country were the same as England. As far as I can see, the ad law have changed from that point. By all kinds of different statutes and codes that have been enacted, all kinds of acts, all kinds of treaties and things since then. But what I see today, the equity jurisdiction has not changed. It has not changed since 1776. It is still the same. All the other jurisdictions at law have morphed and changed. And the same foundation is still there. Back in the text, since the wife had full power of, to dispose of, charge, or mine her separate property for the benefit of her husband as well as those of others, 
and herself, and since she was, she was necessarily exposed to the moral influence of her husband, there was danger lest her separate estate should virtually be as much under his control and liable for his debts as though no settlement to her own separate use had been made, and the property were left under the operation of common law rules. See, there's that default, if you don't know. It defaults to at law, common law. And remember, the definition of common law is this. The law that is common to all people at the time. That's common law. Today, the law today common to all people is statutes and codes. That's common law today. And the common law of today, the statutes and codes, is no different from, in the past, the common law in the past. Because in the past, the law that was common to all people, say, in that jurisdiction was common law. But you've got to remember that equity and common law were distinct. Like common law runs side by side with equity, unless it makes a right turn, something different from equity, common law runs side by side. And as long as it runs side by side with equity, common law is fine. Where it goes wrong is where it diverges from the parallel path. It's operating outside of equity, and it's lost its connection. And you got laws today that have been changed, but equity still is the same, going the same parallel direction that's always been, because it is the foundation that we can always come back to, the touchstone. And we can always come back to equity and its moral principles. And it's the only thing that makes sense because it's the only thing that's fair, just, and right. And that's what everybody's looking for. And if the laws today, the statutes and codes, the common law today, or the common law of yesterday, does not reflect what's fair, just, and right, equity, then that law has done a divergence from its root. Back in the text, experience showed that this danger was actual. To obviate it, the plan was to contrive for inserting in the settlement or conveyance in the clause in restraint of anticipation. Restraint of ad law, maybe? common law going its own path outside of the parallel path of equity? Back in the text, the object of which was to prevent the wife from a, a leaning or charging her separate property or from assigning or exercising other acts of dominion over the income until its payment was due and actually made. The experiment proved successful. The courts gave full force and effect to the clause against anticipation, and the rules concerning it became an established part of the doctrine concerning the wife's equitable separate estate. Footnote 1. It says that this clause is said to be, have been contrived by Lord Thurlow and has been first introduced by him into the settlement of Miss Watson, for whom he was a trustee. The case site that and another one as wife separate estate is wholly a creature of equity and the courts of equity had the power to impose upon any limitations or restrictions even though they might contravene the established doctrines which regulate the use of property in general. In other words, the at law definition. An attempt to impose such a restraint upon alienation and its conveyance in, uh, to a man would of course be nugatory. Case sites to support that.
back in the text, next section, 1108, what words are sufficient? Words that are sufficient. I guess that would mean our meaning. Okay, Black's Law has got eight different definitions of that word. Which one is sufficient? In order to con uh, constitute an effective restraint, the intention must be clear from the expression used that the wife was to be restrained from anticipation. If such an intention is shown, no particular form of words is requisite, nor are expressed negative words essential. The American states which compose the first class heretofore described and the same general rule would necessarily be adopted. In the states forming the second class, however, the material modification of the rule must be made. That's why it's important to define your terms. If you don't have your definitions defined, then you don't know which jurisdiction applies. And the jurisdiction applies to the relationship between the parties. What relation do you have? Remember, the relation is the key. How you're relating to your property, general or special, big difference. Property, the title. What comes to the relationship of the title? Back in the text, since the just despondi in the states is derived from the affirmative provisions of the instrument creating the separate property, and I'm, I'm, I might add, you know, what instrument? It would be an oral instrument. All right, what was spoken? Was it a general deposit or was it a special deposit? Trust. Big difference in the meaning and the understanding of the words, how they're interpreted. The broad and narrow interpretation. It's all this code. But it comes down to do you understand there's two buckets? Equities in one bucket on the right, on the left, contains all the other jurisdictions that you know today, all the other laws. What is the relation of that at law bucket to the bucket of equity? And that would be gleaned from your perspective, your point of view. Because if you have a DC mind, you will see only one bucket. You will not see the other equity bucket. You will not see it being the primary, the foundational one that you're standing on. And everything will be skewed to you as to what the truth is. And you will continually be subject to the statutes and codes because you're an infant still. You don't get how the game is being played. When the dice is rolled, you will do one thing. Instead, you should be doing the opposite. You're ignoring the signpost and the at law that says you're an infant, you're immature in your knowledge because you're not studying. The two by four is hitting you on the head and saying, wake up, get out of here, and you don't know where to run, and you need to run back to equity. And equity is very simple. There's only 13 major maxims in equity, and all those 13 are based off the first one. That's the primary one. And if you understand the first one, he who comes into equity must be doing equity, which is the same as Matthew 7:12, do unto others as you have them do to you what it all boils down to, which is the summation of the Law and the Prophets, really. The Pentateuch. You want to demonstrate your love for God? Love your neighbor as yourself. Recognize that he's got rights also, even the judges. Give them what's fair, just, and right first. And you'll get what's fair, just, and right next. Not only that, but you'll get blessed 10,000 fold. You'll have a hundred fold increase. The 
Just as Bonday in those states is derived from the affirmative provisions of the instrument creating the separate property, the restraint upon the power of disposing or binding the property would be inferred from the whole tenure of the instrument or from the absence of permissive language. Footnote 2. The subject matter on which the restraining clause is to operate may be any kind of property, real or personal, and any estate therein, absolute for life or for years. Footnote 3 with those two footnotes there. Footnote two and three are case sites to support both those. Okay, 1109, effect of the restraint. I think we'll end there. We'll pick up there next time. Section 1109, that's on page 474 of the PDF or page 11, uh, 2567 in the book. Section 1109 on page 474 in the book, the PDF, excuse me. All right, let's go to Q&A and uh, press star 8 if you raise your hand and get in the queue line. Star 8, anybody question? Star 8, anybody? Question? Star 8 to raise your hand. Star 8, anybody? Raise your hand. State your name, where you're from. Any question? Question, press star eight. Bonjour, comment ça va? Christian. Say again? Christian, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, Christian. Hey, just give me a quick second here. I've got to pop on downstairs and get the other computer here and read this to you. Well, it sounds like I might be in a little bit of trouble. This is your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man Bob calling here tonight. Hey, Bob. I might be in a little bit, I might be in a little bit of trouble tonight, but hey, what can we do? I Learning like everybody else here. Just give me a quick second. I won't put the document here. Hold on, please. Well, how can you be trouble? <laughs> okay. Well, I talked to you guys a little bit last time what was going on about a few things. And um, I want, if you don't mind, I'd like to read a letter to you guys I, I prepared today and I actually sent out. And I wouldn't mind getting a critique on it, but I'm pretty sure that I'm going to be in the doghouse before I even get through it. But if you don't mind, I'd like to read to you guys. All right. Okay, um, this is involving a debt collector for in regards to a hospital visit back in 2012. And I, I'm nowhere as to where you are, especially after listening to your call tonight. I mean, I still have a lot, long way to go, but this is what I put in my letter. Notice of interest, private and confidential. Wednesday, March 26, 2014, certified mail number, claim number, and I put down, I sanitized the document here. I put down Ned Steelers, give me your money incorporated, and the address. And attention, Ned Steelers. Dear sir, or to whom it may concern, on Saturday, March 22nd, 2014, your mail, postmark March 3rd, 2014, contained in a notice dated February 28, 2014, came into my possession. As grantor slash beneficiary, I have no evidence, record or otherwise, ever granting any authority to you, Ned Steelers, or give me your money incorporated, including but not limited to staff, employees, directors, officers, 
Give Me Your Money Incorporated, Give Me Your Money Inc., Give Me Your Money International Inc., or Lost Money International Corporation to administer the estate, to, to administer the estate named or known as Jumpin' Jack Flash and all states derived therefrom. The estate named or known as Jumpin' Jack Flash and all states derived therefrom, including property created in the estate named or derived therefrom, here and after will be known as, as estate. All, all assets shall be allocated to the exact grantor slash beneficiary wheretofore any and all derivatives, interest, profits, and mean shall be allocated to the grantor slash beneficiary wheretofore. Your client, Guiding Light Hospital Center, is in breach of trust. Your mailing is the evidence of this breach of trust as this trust was private in nature. I have in my possession a copy of the Guiding Light Hospital Center authorization form clear, clearly showing a restricted signature from the executor of the House of Flash. As grantor slash beneficiary, I have no evidence the executor, Jumpin' Jack, was ever contacted properly to help you, to help with any dispute or matter that may have come to fruition with Guiding Light Hospital Center. As well, there are at least two witnesses to the restrictions given to Guiding Light Hospital Center. Again, this trust, private nature, is now breached. Also, take notes on page two, uh, item nine of the authorization form, it states, quote, this authorization is subject to revocation at any time except to the extent that action has been taken in reliance thereon, and in any event shall expire and become null and void 60 days following its signing. The date the restricted signature was given was October 14, 2012. Today is Wednesday, March 26, 2014. Clearly, more than 60 days has passed. Therefore, you, Ned Steelers, Guy Light Hospital Center, Give Me Your Money, Inc., and any other entity are without authorization to administer the estate even in regards to this particular point I'm going to point out here. Your mailing is evidence of your administration of the estate and a clear violation of the limitation noted in Item 9 of the authorization form, whether you were given notice or not by Guy and Light Hospital Center or any other entity. Further, I see no account number, patient name, medical record number, or physician on page 1 of this authorization form. This clearly indicates that the, the deceptive practice of Guy and Light Hospital Center in getting patients assigned the authorization form. This evidence can be shown to be no different than asking a patient to sign a blank check to their checking account. No one would normally take such action. Further, having kidney stones is no lack of matter. In fact, having spoken to a number of people myself, some of who have had kidney stones themselves, say it, say it is worse than being in labor with child. As previously indicated in this notice, I, grantor slash beneficiary, have no evidence, record or otherwise, ever granting you, Ned Steelers, or Give Me Your Money Incorporated, or any other entity in this matter, any authority of any kind to administer the estate, except Guy Light Hospital Center, and that was with the restricted authority and for a limited time. If you administer the estate or wish to administer the estate, see the enclosed authorized copy of the fee schedule of the House of Flash. You may contact Executive Jumpin' Jack at the following temporary address, but there's an address there. The terms and conditions and payment of the fee schedule for administering the estate will be sent to you. This notice, private and confidential, is under special deposit. As grantor size beneficiary, I retain all right, power, and interest in this private matter. All rights reserved by grantor beneficiary, Jumpin' Jack Flash. Now, I did that letter for a friend today. And set that out for him. I'll set it to him but for him to go out in the mail for him if you get a chance to get that out in the mail. I wouldn't mind your comments on that one. Just read to you, Kristen, please. Actually, it's, that's not too bad. Okay. Um, I, uh, Kristen, I, you know what? I've known you for a while now. I've been away for a couple of years. So I do my own thing like that. But you know what? I'm back into this stuff. It's equity. And it's just. If anyone can sit down, even with the last three weeks, like that, even such a night, and sit back, it's just all common sense. I mean, which, which, which jurisdiction do you want? Do you want an equal jurisdiction, or do you want the outlaw jurisdiction? Or do you want all the different jurisdictions of the law that are into one, in one puzzle, or do you want the equal jurisdiction? I just don't see how people who can come on your call, I'm not putting them down, but I just, I, I wish, I hope that they can see what you're talking about, because this is so clear that our remedy lies in equity. So, anyhow, with what my friend presented to me here, this is what I came up with best, just like that. There was a trust that was created. It may, it may not have been the best trust for him, because I know he's, he's struggling to what he's doing, but and at the same time, I'm trying to do the best I can with what I'm studying here. And, again, I'm not as far as where, where you people are like that. 
Oh, and the other thing is this. I want to have ready, but I don't have it yet. I was reading your, um, listen to your audio that Pat gave me here the other day from January 18th of 2010 on the ruins. The ruins, I think it's practical trees on ruins like that. And the first 20 pages, well, you went up through the first two pages to talk about the simple trust and the special trust and all that stuff. And even in those first two pages that you read that night, it's just really amazing to see how equity comes into play and how a trust really works. Mm-hmm. You know, so anyhow, I just have to pass this by you here and get your thoughts on the on the letter. Um, I apologize if I don't have any more questions for you this time, but maybe I will so that people get a chance to talk on the call tonight. I'll, I'll, I'll come back in. Well, maybe let's, let's go over this a little bit now. Uh, sure. What I might do that would be different would be I might not include so much private information because this is a, uh, an, an agent trying to enforce a a contract and trying to collect. Right. In other words, they're they're breaching because they're trespassing. Right, and, and that's what I said. This this uh, for him, I sat there and said to him, I said, hey, this led they're breaching. They're trying to interfere on a private contract. But what you can do, I can, I'm trying not to say his name. Um, that's what you can do is this this letter that he sent you is the evidence of the breach. Yeah. Yeah. So if they're just an agent functioning as a collection agency, then all I need to do is tell them that they're – give them notice that they're breaching on a, a, a private trust. Right. And, well, that, that, see, that's actually what we're going to do right now. I said – I said I, I try not to say his name. Um, I you don't have to. You know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't exclude so much the nature of the private trust like you did. I would as – you know, all I need to know is that they're – Breaching and they're a notice of a breach if they're going to trespass. Well, I, what I did for him was this. I, I, um, I said to him, we now need to send a letter to this hospital for you to notify them that they now breach a truck, private trust that, that he had. He's telling me he had. Yes, because the back to the hospital, they've got the notion that this is a regular commercial general deposit. And the problem rests with the hospital because you did a special deposit with them and it's a trust. So they're misconstruing the trust and hiring the agents to come after you. Well, exactly. And that's what I was telling my friend here. I thought, I'm going, hey, this is what we got to take care of. But at least this is what we did for now. Um, and yeah. I said, the way we can take care of what we have. Notice just to the, trust, the agents that are trying to trespass that they're, you know, this is not the relationship that they're enforcing. And there's no nexus with me because of that. And I okay. would bring the nexus up between well, you and the hospital. Well, where I was coming from with him for him was this, was they're, they are, the letter from them was, um, and he sent me a scan of it. Um, I'm trying to remember the scan said, something about noses is an attempt by a debt collector or something like that, blah, 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 and, and whatever it was. And I, I'm sitting there saying, well, hold on a second. They're administering your estates. I said, they've got two entities now are trying to administer your estate. First of all, the hospitals are breaching your trust the first one when you can't restrict the signature. The second one is this one right here like that now. Now, why, why want, is the hospital what, a breach of trust? What I wanted to say then was this, was I was t- say, to me in this letter I prepared from the day was, we're going to say, hey, Mr. Debt Collector, if you want to administer the estate, Fine and dandy. Here's the fee schedule. Write back and let us know, and we'll find you the terms and conditions and the fee and the fees that help take it from there. That's what I want. Mostly, that was my concern for him was to get them into a position that if they ignore him after this letter was sent out, I don't know what he's done. He has to send it out tomorrow, so he may modify this right back because he did that before with his other issues he was dealing with, and. Um, to say, hey, if, if they ignore this letter, at least you got this on the record of what you sat there said to them, and they cannot deny that it wasn't done. And that's what I'm saying. So if this agent or this debt collector, we're going to call them, uh, they're trying to interfere with a private trust. So if they do want to administer the state, and let, let's say, let's say, um, uh, Kristen, that they go and sell it to another debt collector. Well, that, again, that would be a breach of this trust. To me, okay. Uh, okay. Let's for me, I created, I created for him. I created trust for him, and the, and this paperwork here for him because this and this debt collector, give me, uh, I call it, give me your money and corporate here. I, I put them into a, a trust. 
And if you want mission state, there's a private and blah, 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 blah. So if they say, well, uh, we don't want to deal with this, let's, let's sell it to another debt collector down the road. No, because now you did just breach the trust I created. Now, what I'm going to do, I heard you say that you've got to give them 14 days. Well, I thought we'd give them 20 days just like that. And if, now, here's the thing I didn't do. I didn't specifically point out the guy's name um, uh, that he was going to be the trustee, but I put it down for my friend that he clearly was a grantor slash beneficiary. And I'm looking at this point from listening to your audio here, Kristen, that if they don't respond back within 14 or, say, 20 days, then I say, what we need to do then is follow up on that and say to this guy, hey, you accept the position of being the trustee of, of, for this trust that was just created like that. I require you to remove all records and all files from all public records, whether it be the, the credit report and bureau or the hospital like that, from all records. You have, and you have X amount of days to do so. That's my thoughts. Yeah, you could do it that way. Uh, because okay. anything that was converted from the original trust is really trust res, even though it's right. Right. And that person gets converted into a trustee because he's holding trust res. Well, see, and then you mentioned tonight on May's call, well, how there's always, and, and the other calls too, but the place called Miss there's always two trusts, executory trust work in a play right now. So I asked him what was going on, and he told me that when he had his kidney stones, and he went in there and said, look, I, I do have kidney stones, can you help me out? He said to me that all they did was they took, they took an actual of him, and they gave him a prescription for pain pills, for pain, like, I don't know what it was, um, and he didn't get a prescription for pain pills anyhow, and then he said they gave him a, a a uh, referral to a doctor that he could go to, and one of those doctors would take, like, say, a, an ultrasound machine or wherever it was and, and, and break down or zap that stone that he has. And he never did end up going to that doctor or, or get a pay to it, but he just had to do it himself. And my thought was, well, okay, now, there's two trusts here because, look, they, he went to the emergency department, and I see his point, but I see the hospital point of view, and that's what you're talking about tonight earlier on, about there are always two sides to the, the, the um, they also have equitable rights, is what you're saying, because they did, okay, so his point of view this afternoon from talking to me on the phone was, they did um, x-ray him, they did verify that he did have kidney stones, but they didn't do anything for him. You see, he still had to wait to go to a, a doctor, to the referral doctor. He didn't have any money to go get the pain pills, he said. I know he's, I know he's really tired of money right now. And he's telling me that because he did that, so he just didn't deal with himself. But he's pissed. He's pissed because why? They didn't take care of him. He okay. came to them to help him out, and they didn't take care of him, although they took x-rays. So he didn't get a specific performance what he came in there for. Right, and that's what he was trying to tell me. I, 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 I told him before. Now they're trying to bill him for it. Well, see, that's just it. Because, you know, without getting to our businesses, I don't know why I have my own computer business like stuff like that. And and, and my friend, oh, God, I don't want to get what, too, pers- too much personal information on the phone here, but on the call. But he, um, I said, look. When a customer comes into your shop and they ask you, they want you to do uh, some graphic, he does graphic artwork. And I said, you do all this graphic artwork like that. And see, I, I said, I'm like, when people come to my computer store, I was assigned. There's a diagnostic fee right up front. And you got to pay that first. Or I won't tell you what kind computer. Um, I you walked, walked into the hospital. Number. You walked into the hospital and you signed a document that says that you're liable for charge for all their services that they give you. Well, that was just it. He told me that he didn't sign the document trial like probably four hours later in a, while he was in one of these emergency rooms like that after he was taken like that. And he was sitting there all his time. And he was in a lot of – he said he was bent over. When he went into that emergency room, he was bent over. Well, you're saying so they, they're going to charge you because you've taken some of their services. And that's yeah. what they're legally going to go as a legal contract. Yeah, for, exactly. For the, now, would, would that legal contract be considered an executory contract because they did do work? Yes, if it's not expressed. If it's not expressed as an executory contract, which is a tr- two trust now, that, you know, there's where the argument come in because you didn't get on the other side of the trust, the executory, you didn't get the the uh, the property. And what was the property that you wanted? That was the, yes. the the service to eliminate the, your problem. 
Right, his kidney stones, yes. You didn't get that, did you? No. That's what he told me. He said he never got the kidney stones. He was there for like four or five Your hours. Your remains to be unexecuted yet. Their trust was executed because you got services. So that's what they're charging you for, but they're looking yeah. at a contract. You gotta express it to be a trust, and then when it's an inequity, it's not just one trust, it's two trusts, and you can bring in your other trust on the other side that you didn't get the service. And it still okay. needs to be executed. So how could they be charging you for something you didn't get? Well see, and, that, and that's just the funny thing about all this, and that's why I try to tell them, so I say, listen, um, that's what, okay. I have so many thoughts going through my head, and I'm trying to teach them the best that I can about what we're learning about equity and all that stuff, because, as you know, we have studied under another person over the last couple of years while we're learning that part of it all, and that's fine, Danny, that's over and done with. But definitely, I'm trying to get him over into the equitable side, and it's, he's doing that's, his best. But that's it's one way of playing that. His unique situation that he's got here, he could play it that way. But also, oh. you could just do a special deposit. And that special deposit was the payment, and they have been paid. And what are you collecting from me for? Well, uh, there's one more thing I want to say before I forget, I, if, I, if we keep on going, is this. You know, I, I read your How NTT Has Evolved document here, which was just put out, what, in January or February of this year, 2014. I don't want, I want to get back to our, our, the subject here of my friend that had to go to the hospital. But, you know, in that document, is either Lisa or somebody prepared it, so said, we're not going to do your documents for you. This is what I find very frustrating on my side, Kristen, because you know why? It's like, I did this document. I did a generic document for him. I gave him the information I found online about the company, about, about this debt collector, because he didn't know how to find him with this debt collector like that and everything else. And I don't know what he's going to do with it. And then when I usually talk to him afterwards, like he dealt with those three other entities I was talking to you about a couple of weeks ago, some, some of those other entities he's been dealing with. That which, which, which is quite fine now. Uh, matter of fact, we're going. Matter of fact, for those three entities, we're going to serve. We're going to serve them and notice a default that they agree that they have no claim against the estate, uh, against this estate, against this property. But you know, getting back is that this is why people need to do their own paperwork because it can get very frustrating and very time-consuming on our on on our end, like me and you and lease and stuff like that, preparing these documents for other people, trying to be nice about help people out, because this is just time-consuming, man. Time-consuming and frustrating when you don't know what the other person has done. Well, the thing is that uh, the one who prepared the document knows how to prepare the documents, but the one who gets the documents, they don't know how to use the documents because they don't know the documents because they didn't prepare the documents. Right, exactly. And but that's just what I want to stress. Like I said, I was just reading that 2000, oh, February 2013. Judge, it takes him 20 seconds to figure out you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, and that's what I was telling him, too. I said, so look, if you ever go to court, they're going to know exactly what, when you, the first few words out of your mouth, whether you know what you're talking about or not. And it's just like what, um, I don't know, the end that. You know how to enforce your own rights. I can't enforce your rights for you. Right. It's just like Dan was talking last week. There about the judge who asked him about, well, he, he, wanted, he kind of tested him on equity, whether he knew where equity came from or stuff. And most the other guy who sat there said the judge cleared the courtroom and took off his road and sat down with him and then realized that this guy really did know he, what he thought about when it came to equity. And then he put his road back on it and said, well, okay, this case is dismissed. You're done. Carry. Right. You know? So anyhow, um, I came up with this letter here today. I spent almost a whole day on this trying to put all the pieces of the puzzle together for him and stuff like that. And I sent it off. I think I did a decent job for what I know so far at equity, but I definitely like to, you know, I mean, thank you so much for the class that you put on because this is just, um, when you read this kind of stuff like that. And um, the one thing I'll say is this, like I, I caught out of the talking with the wife today and whether the husband's alive or not and all that stuff, and she's been willed with his property and all that stuff. To, to me, the key word today is property. It's all about property. And it doesn't have, I, uh, I think it could be really uh, much easier than what the legal system makes it, to be yeah, honest. I think is, the legal really. system... Really, you know, I mean, why couldn't you sit there and say, on a living will, say, um, um, all my property um, is the... All my property 
uh, is to be retained by my partner or my spouse or like that, all right, tell an interest upon my passing. Therefore, we say something like that. I, I don't know it better, but we say something like that, Chris, it's like saying, hold on a second. So I pass away today, and here's my living will, and it says, hey, upon my passing, my partner here, my sweetheart, she gets all my property, and she retains, and she retains all like total interest. It's as if, as if, if she never even, as if she always had it all along. Am I on the right track with that? Uh, well, I don't know about a sweetheart, but uh, it could well, be. Because uh, you were talking about the, the, the nice class about the wife and all that stuff and, and dower and all that stuff. That's the other part was in, in that Lewin's part was about a dower. The point is the person. wife is looked at differently at law as compared to in equity. Right. Yeah. Okay, so the wife is looked at differently in the at law compared to equity. What I was just saying was, saying, well, why couldn't a will just be simple and say, hey, upon my death, my um, – my wife or my partner and put her name down, you know, Jane Mary Smith, you know, retains all white right colonies to my property. But then again, it comes down to which jurisdiction that you invoke because that's going to apply the meaning of how they understand it in that jurisdiction. And it could be at law well, or it could be in equity. Two different well, ways of looking at it. I agree with what you're saying. I'm just trying to make it really easy here on this call at this point. I'm going to say, shall so I retain all equitable interests? All rights tolerance on, on, of an equal interest, you know. Anyhow, um, I, thought I, passed by, yeah. I thought I passed this by you, Chris, if your thoughts were. Um, next week, I hope to have, um, I want to have tonight, I want to have those first two pages done, but I just got sidetracked here, but I want to have that ruins, those first 20 pages of trust. And you know how they use the words uses and in and all that stuff? I want to have all that. I want to have those first 20 pages of Lewin's translated with the pr proper meaning of those words that I found yesterday and to, uh, yesterday while going over that. That would make sense to everybody that was spoken that, that can be spoken in terms of today's language today. Because a lot of those words in that Lewin is is you know, almost every sentence you have to take about two stops and look in Black Law Dictionary to see what that specific word meant, and that's very important. Because we we were never taught how to talk like this, or like the fee offment, the fee and fee offment, and the uh, fee off fee, which is a trustee and all that stuff. Yeah, we've lost we that are, knowledge of that because we don't speak that way anymore. Right, exactly. So I think what I'm going to do, if I can have it done, I, I should have it done for next Wednesday, is I'm going to have that uh, the whole 20 pages of Lewis done. But uh, really, nothing's but, changed. It's just the words we use. It's still right. it's still fee offment and fee off fees. Oh, really? I mean, like, you, I, yeah, I couldn't just sit there. Oh, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to translate in terms of the words of trustee and all that stuff and put that stuff in. Like, well, you mentioned what the word was. E. What? The off E is trustee. Right, exactly. And you used the word that in, the word that was italicized in that had to do with the meaning of. Um, yeah, the off or uh, is grant for. Right, and in was had something to do with an act of, 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 of contracts like that. Another one, another the Othman had to do with the act of conveying land. Yeah. So I just, I just want to put those words out, those, those unusual words, and put plain English words in there, and I'll give it to, give you guys a doctor next week, and maybe we can go over that a little bit so everybody can, and talk about that too as well, because I was reading that yesterday, studying that that, that audio, and I'm going, wow, because Pat brought my attention here, because I got so much on the go right now. She brought my attention. She was really excited by that audio as well. I'm going, man, hey, I'm going through Black Slot Dictionary, and you're going through it too as well. I'm making little little yellow post-it notes beside that Lewin, as you as you read along, you see those words, and you start explaining what, what Black Slot Dictionary words said this and it said that. And I thought, you know what, I should just take all these little post-it notes and just write, rewrite this whole thing using these post-it notes in place of the words that were, were being distracted. And I think everybody would love to see that document. You know, that's just my thoughts anyhow, dude. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And I'm glad that at least I'm on the right track with what I'm doing here. And um, this has been a real mind twister because, as you know, many of us have been raised up or um, even, the, even the guru movement, if you want to call it that. Um, we've all been let down to, to think one way and look at things a different way. I still haven't gotten to the point, though, of um, looking at the Constitution as – as an equitable thing, that 
that might take me a little bit of time, but I'll look at that well, later on if I can. Written because the written is is uh the written and the spirit, that's what's equitable. And the spirit is not written in the constitution, it just mentioned equity. But to get the meaning of what equity is, that's the spirit what the meaning of equity is, and that's written outside the Constitution. Okay. That's the the two types of interpretation, because the narrow view now says we will not look at anything that's not literally written in the Constitution, because it's not in the Constitution written. But the broad view is the one that says, hey, this Constitution was written with a spirit, and the spirit is the explanation of what equity is, and that is supported with the other writings. And there's the two different interpretation views, and they're in conflict. Yeah, I'm going to look, listen to this. I don't hear that part you just said again, because you said there said there was yeah two ways of looking at the Constitution. Another thing you mentioned that reminded me of what Lewis was, but the narrow policy of common law, you know, and you believe that that's why in 1933 um, they changed the system again, and it was actually completed in 1966 or 68, you said, that they finally were able to pretty well put aside equity under the veil, if you can say, under the curtain, behind the curtain, so people couldn't see it, if you could say it that way. Yeah, when they but, murdered uh, courts in their one civil action, and they actually did that yeah. before 1933. Yeah. Well, again, see, um, you know, there's another thing you talked about, too, about, about um, if I could say it this way, just hear me over a second. If we were in equity today, to me, everything, we, we would be paying for everything with gold and silver. But we're not in the equity today. We're on the at-law side, if you can say it that way, and therefore we're using what they would call legal tender or whatever they want to call legal tender or as money. Does that make sense? Uh, in a way, but you could use money as anything that you want. It's just a medium of exchange. But the trouble is, right. Woody, do you really need a medium of exchange? Well, the way yeah. I, I understand from you now is that, no, we don't because we actually just got to take the debt and uh, uh, I don't want to say accept it because I, I don't want to get back to the accepting for value process, but we take the, the presentment and claim our interest on that and claim the title and, and then uh, – Claim the title and then move the title. They have to be accept the debt because I mean, in equity, I don't accept the debt. Right, that's what I'm saying. I don't want to get into the accept the, accept the part. That's that's the old debtor creditor stuff. But I'm just talking about um, I accept the equity. Uh, equity. Right, yeah, you you um, you accept the equitable part of that presentment to you. The substance part, yeah. Right, and then so there's where you the take spirit the, of it. Right, the soul of it, and then you take you take that, and then you move it, and uh, from there. Um, my, if my view is there is no debt in equity because equity hates a forfeiture and a penalty, which is nothing it's more than usury. Performance, which is nothing more than um, usury, right? Yeah, duty. Yeah, a trust. A usury. And, God and Jesus Christ were against usury. As a matter of fact, they said you don't use your own, own interest. Right. Okay. Well, at least we got a good talk for that part there as well. Like that maybe I'll get to it's change. Like, uh, okay. uh, all humans have inherited the earth through Adam, and Adam was given the earth freely. He came from the earth. He came from substance. Right. So what you got free you use of. Why are you charging me? It's free to everybody. Right. So Except you, for that. Have, you didn't really have title to anything to charge me for because you don't own it. You're just using it. But you did read that. You did read a section, though. I think it's on that January 18th, 2010 call. Where you read there so something from the book or the Black Law Dictionary, I think it was. There was like a footnote you're talking about. Where, the, where it came out to be that the state owned all the property. And you said, said and you thought you owned your property when the state does. Yeah, but who's the state? The state is the right. we the people. <laughs> the state is what? We the people. But that's where the yeah, confusion comes in. We think that the uh, state 
is the servants of government. No, it's not. The state is we the people. The state and the people are the same. So who owns the property? We all do. Right, but we haven't put our equitable claim in it yet, though. Right? We, have, we haven't switched the relationships. Uh, we haven't expressed it to be something different than a general deposit. Right. I would draw the general center we deposit on our special deposit, thereby giving you notice. And that's why I was so coming withdrawal up with redeposit. Friend. Yeah, and that's what's coming up with my friend for, too, as well. So I'm like, hey, when you went and got that, and he's also got a truck loan right now. I say, well, what you do is this. When you get a truck loan, you actually buy a law because of the banking law, which is their own law, you, it became their property. And if you can, this picture, take them that, when you give them that, uh, promissory note or a loan application and they took it in their property and they put it into one account and said they were over on the right side as their asset. Meanwhile, the bank's, uh, the bank's got 10,000 customers and they have going out 10,000 accounts, but they only have one pool. And in that pool, they have 10,000 accounts because everyone does a general deposit and all their money goes into that account. So meanwhile, you give them an asset and you didn't give them a, give them a restricted, restricted signature, so it now becomes a bank's asset and the bank's property. And what the bank gives you back is their property or their casino chips, and because it's their casino chips, they're saying, hey, we want you to pay interest or taxes on this, and guess what? The IRS, the IRS is going to look at your bank account and say, hey, well, you went through X amount of dollars this year in your bank account, so you know that we know that you use our casino chips, therefore we want you to pay tax on that. When if you can just withdraw your general signature and redeposit your signature again on a special deposit, claim that asset is yours, now it's yours, you give them notice. Hey, Mr. CFO of the bank, take that apply towards my account. What is that, 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 um, so what does that count as all the debt? Right, right. That's it. That's what it boils down to. And a non-express oh. trust instead of a general deposit, it's a special deposit. Okay. Now, I have a question for you like this. I asked you for about two weeks ago, there's some about that claim. Um, the claim number was a uh, registered mail number. Am I correct? Did I, um, did I hear you correctly when you sat there and said that you don't, you don't actually have to send yourself a blank envelope with, with a registered mail number. You can just use a registered mail number, right? Yeah, it's just one little more piece of evidence that there was a, a unique number that represents okay. the rest. Okay, but can I ask you a question then? Because I know right now the post office will not give you, will not, I actually asked them, they will not give me um, a registered mail label number unless I actually go ahead and buy it. And they say even then they have to hold on to it until I come into the actual, into the post office and then pay for it right then and there. But if essentially they would hold it for me and then give me the number over the phone. So how did you guys get your retro mail numbers? Did you guys just make them up yourselves or what? Well, I believe we used to get a, a stamp and we used to put the stamp number on it. Like the label you mean? Yeah, they would give you like, uh, they would tear oh, really? a strip and then you'd have like 10 of them. They'd just give you 10 of them. Okay, and guess what? They're not doing that anymore, dude. They will not give me, I said, he give me about four or five, so we can't do that. We can wait. If you want, I said, I, I said, look, I need this for letters going out for my own, for my own personal use. And this was like probably about two, three years ago. And I said, for my own personal use, she said, well, we, we're not allowed to give them out anymore. I said, I think I heard what I could group. do is I could take a references, a, a bunch of numbers that I would make up for that I got from, say, the post office. I would make them up myself. And I would give public notice of these numbers as being, you know, just like you would do on the UCC, registered, and then uh, you claim those numbers. Okay. And then I would use that. All right. Then I, yeah, I, don't that one. Uh, uh, I, I just need to create a record. Okay. Uh, the, the reason why I was asking, Chris, Chris was because, like I said, that I, they, this, I was just trying to pictures from mine what we were talking about here a couple of weeks ago. But at least I know, and, and I get, thank you for all your help, because at least I know I'm on the right track of my thinking. But it, it is, what I've done is this, is, I, is I've taken control, I've taken care of the at-law side. If you want, if you want to minister to the state, here's a fee schedule. But otherwise, I'm going to sell this to an equitable account. And if you, and if if you want to ignore my equity, and right now, so I do not know what you know. I still have a lot to learn yet. But if you want to ignore my equitable claim like that, and yeah, I, don't have a, well, I don't use a fee schedule. I use a special deposit. You know, okay, I'm not charging well, them for use of my stuff. I'm going to give them special deposit. Okay, special deposit. We'll, we'll take it from there. I'll think about that later on. 
Anyhow, thanks for letting me read this letter. I'm getting that back. I'll have to give him a call tomorrow and um, talk to him about that, see what he's done with his letter, how he sent it out like that. But gives us something to think about. At least I know I'm on the right track, okay? So, what do you call much. it again? You call it a fee schedule for what? Well, I call it a fee schedule. You know, it's just a fee schedule for a ministry in the estate. That's all. I, I just call it that. I say, hey, if you want ministry in the estate, here's a fee schedule, you know? I mean, I just, I, I was just trying to protect him uh, from the right, law. I don't know if you're administering the estate. I would call it a fee schedule for the use of the res that's in special deposit. Okay. Well, see, again, that's why I said it. Again, when I first want to call here, Chris, was uh, you might bite my head off because at the very beginning of the call, you're talking about how you guys really don't know how. Some of you guys don't know how to operate and keep private and all that stuff. I go, oh, boy, he's going to shoot me tonight, you know. <laughs> I, I, I'm just doing the best I can, you know. And I just, I, oh, did you get shot you, down? Well, no, no, but, you know, it's just stuff I go, what's going to happen? It, 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 was it bad? Was it painful? No, but the thing was is that he he actually was on a timeline, and what my concern was for him was, uh, and the very beginning, so I said, see, on, uh, I said, when did, when did you get this letter? He said, well, I came to my attention here on this Saturday, right? but it was postmarked March the 3rd, and when he opened it up, it was actually day of February 28th, and on the back of his death collection letter he he read to me was, you have 30 days. I said, holy shit, man, you only got 30 days. you got to get going on this. So I, I, here I am today going, I'm, I'm trying to come up with the best I can. So I said, hey, look, get a fee schedule. Let's put, get a fee schedule and say, if you want to minister the estate on, on the at-law side, because it's hard to explain this sometimes to people, the at-law and the at-law side. He understands there's two different jurisdictions, but it is hard for some people, Kristen, to see that. I don't know why, but it is. But So I just quickly let him, hey, if you want to do that, here's a fee schedule. They have problems of thinking in duality. That's their problem. Right. And most of you said because we've been taught to think uh, single-minded, I guess he wants to say that way. So. We've been taught to think commingled. Yeah. That's the confusion yeah, that's... when everything's all combined together and in one. No, it's actually segregated. It's, uh, it's a duality. And then as long as if you got that straight in your mind, then you start seeing things differently. Well, see, it's like the description of, of the bucket, the, the bucket of water that uh, that um, Lisa gave out, where there's a, like a, a clear glass plate going down the center of the bucket. On one half is a, is a group of uh, piranhas, on the other half is a, is a group of goldfish. But if you look on the side, they all they all look like they're they all look like they're one. But if you look from the top down, you'll see that there's a glass plate in the middle, and there are actually two separations of, of them. You know, right. the at-law side is a piranhas, and the uh, echo side is a goldfish. Yeah, if you're an at-law, at you'll see one bucket with fish in it. If you are uh, got the eyes of equity on, you'll see the divider between it and it's two separations in the bucket. Right, exactly. Okay, well, listen, I better get, I better get somebody else in my chance to talk on here. Thank you for the time of the call tonight. I look forward to talking to you guys next week. All right, Bob. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for coming on, Bob. You're welcome. Who's next? Oh, Clearboard? Nobody there? No questions. Clearboard. Anybody got a question? Press star 8. Star 8? Anybody questions? Star 8, anybody questions? Star 8, anybody? We have a question, Star 8. Anybody? Yep. Nobody? No questions? Okay, going to be a short night. Star 8, anybody? Hello? Yes. Who's this? Hey, it's uh, Christian Brown. Uh, Christian, how you doing? Hey, right, good. How you doing, Chris? Not too bad. Um, hypothetically hey, dealing with uh, at law on uh, independent action, um, and the defendant never answered the uh, um, inter uh, uh, interrogatories, and, and I have a status hearing coming up, uh, hypothetically in April, on um, April ninth, something like that. Mm -hmm. This is one. What uh, this one actually from the experience? What should I what, what could I expect from the status hearing? 
right, what's the hearing called again? It's called a status hearing. So I'm just trying to figure out, you know, what to expect in, uh, from your experience potentially uh, in the status hearing. Well, they're going to look at emotions that are in play. And are there any emotions in play now? Um, I was going to, I'm thinking about doing, um, I'm going to file a motion for default judgment since he hasn't, it's been over 30 days and, he, and they haven't answered the um, interrogatory. Let's, let's back up. Uh, what about this? Uh, they didn't answer the interrogatories and the discovery and stuff. Right. Uh, what are you doing with that? I mean, that was, that was, it was, uh, hypothetically filed back, uh, January 30th. And the complaint. They didn't answer the complaint. Wait a minute. They didn't answer your complaint? Right. Or they didn't answer your request for discovery or interrogatories? You know, what did you ask them for? Um, just, uh, uh, original note, wire transfers, uh, pretty much um, what you had had on some of your recordings before, the whole list there. And also ask them to produce the name of the name of the trust. Ask for production of documents. Right. And you mentioned interrogatories. Did you actually send them interrogatories? Yes, that, that was a part of the complaint. Okay, they didn't answer those either? No. You know, your, your standard thing, chain of title and all that, you know, I think it was a like list of them. I don't have it right in front of me, but. They said they didn't produce the documents. They did right. answer the interrogatories. Right. In other words, those two discovery requests, they did not do. Correct. All right. What did you do then? Well, that's, that's kind of where I'm at now because have, I have a status hearing coming up, but I'm thinking I should put a motion in for default judgment. Yeah, if they didn't answer those things and didn't produce those things, they're they're handing you the win on a silver platter if you know how to use it. Okay. I want, I want to know how to <laughs> – that's what I want to know. I want to be sure I know how to use it. Okay. I, I would put in – got to get an order from the court to order them to produce the things that they haven't produced and to answer what they haven't answered. Okay. So you need to go to a hearing. I would prepare a notice of a hearing to compel them to do those things. Okay, so that's that's the next step. Okay. So then, if you go to this hearing that you're going to go to for the status, you know you got something in play, discovery you're asking for, and they won't move it on past that. And that's the status of the case. Because if you ah. have a request for discovery in motion and in play, then they're going to say, hey, this should be going on to trial or it should be uh, going on to uh, uh, summary judgment. Okay. Okay. But what you want to do, is I would take and through the court, you get an order, and I can't get an order unless I got a hearing, and the hearing I want to go to and set is I want to get an order from the court to compel them to do the discovery I asked for. Now, when they don't do the discovery, now they're in breach of a court order. I see. Okay. Then when I got the breach of the court order, then I would order the court to compel them to, to produce. produce. And when they don't do that, then I'm going to ask the court to dismiss it as a sanction. Now, this is a, this is an independent action, though. No. This is all done. Did they take you to court? Yeah, that's the yeah, that's the, what, the case they have have against me. All this I'm telling you right now is purely done in the legal court that they took you into. But what I'm asking you to do is purely equitable because discovery is equitable. Now, when they okay. don't do the equitable thing, come up with the documents and the discovery that they're supposed to have, then they obviously don't have the right what they say they have. And once I get the order from the court and they don't comply with the order of the court, they're in breach of a court order. And that, that is a sanctionable action by the court. And the sanction I want 
is I want motion to dismiss as a sanction. Okay, okay. The case against me, okay. That might be bad. Okay, I'm with you. That's the automatic win. Okay. They're falling down your funnel trap, and you're going to suck them into the narrow opening, and you're going to send them through the wine press. Let them have the judgment. Let them have the judgment, yeah. Because they're not living equitable. Yeah. Sanction is motion to dismiss. Okay. But the important thing is the court order. If they're in breach of court order, then they're toast. But you got to keep up with this because you want to hit it as fast as you can. One, two, three. I want to hit them with a one, two, three punch. I don't give them any time in between. Okay. When it says 30 days, on the 31st date, I've got all my documents done prior to that, and on the 31st day, I'm putting them back in the court for the next operation, the next hearing. I'm moving my case forward as fast as I can. But you want a order out of the court. you got to Words get okay. orders. And you got to put motions in that have to be heard, and you have to do all that by notice. And this is just basic rules of court, and everybody's got the books or access, you know, through the internet and stuff that you can look what the rules of court is. And you just have to know the procedures that goes on, and you can use that to your advantage. And all this is purely operating just in legal court. Legal with the equitable discovery. But if you don't create the records through the court, then the court won't act. It's got to be done through the court. That's why you use the court to do the enforcement. Okay. You use the court to do the equitable enforcement of a lack of discovery. When they don't do the discovery, you got them. I think I'm uh, squared away on that. I got that. Then all this takes in, you know, appropriate uh, affidavits of what you did as your own testimony as a witness, and you need two records, the SOIs to support, you know, what you're claiming, the NOI. Notice of interest, statement of interest, okay. So uh, that's a pretty basic uh, and pretty simple to do stuff, really. But yet uh, people get hammered every day because they don't know how to do that. So anything else? Yeah, I, was, I just want to get this, you know, get uh, what you thought about that. Make sure I'm on the right track, and uh, so you, you covered that. Appreciate it. But you got to keep moving it forward, and you uh, got to know the timeline, and you got to know the time, and then have it all ready to go. One, two, three. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks again. And thank you and your wife, and uh, may God continue to bless you all. Okay. All right, Chris. Thanks for coming on then. All right. Thanks. Nobody's on the board? Uh, we got a clear board again. Anyway, star eight, question? Star eight. Anybody, question? Raise your hand. Star eight. Okay. Last call. We'll count down then. Star eight going once. Anybody? Star eight. Anybody question? Press star eight. Star eight going twice. Star eight. Anybody question?
Sorry, going twice. Sorry, anybody? Last call. Hey, Chris, this is Bob calling here. I, I actually, yeah, I'm just seeing a question in the room here because I don't know if you can see the room or not, but it says Spook888 has asked the question, where does CW get his SOI statement of interest that at birth the government uses an actuary table to convert our birth into currency and then issue the currency to the public? Well, you know, the insurance companies have an actuary table for everything. They got it all blank. Yep. Plotted out and calculated. Well, see, that's why I, I don't know if I said this before on the, on the first call here a couple of weeks ago, and that's where I found out from a guy on the one of the groups called Reclaim Your Securities, and the, the founder of that group. And he, I put all the messages together, and I just pieced it all together. And he said that when you were born, your mother felt a registration of live birth. From there, the hospital, by statute and codes and stuff like the regulations, they had to send that registration on live birth that your mother filled out to the county recorder. And the county recorder has his own duties that he's got to do. And one of them is to say he's got to open up an account, assign that account a number, and then deposit that registration on live birth with your mother's handwriting on it, saying her into that account generally into that account. From there, he then issues a certified copy of registration on live birth, and that was on the state side. And then from there, he issues a certified copy of the Russian life birth and sends it to um, sends, sends it to the um, Department of Treasury on the federal side. And again, on the, the federal side, what do they do? They open up an account, and I found out after the fact that they actually, they actually signed the same account number as they did at the state side to that account on the federal side. And again, they deposit that certified copy of the Russian life birth into that account generally into that account. From there, they then create what's called a birth bond. The next instrument they created after that is what's called a um, short-form birth certificate. The first one was a long-form birth certificate. This one is now called a short-form birth certificate. Once a short-form birth certificate has been created, they then take that birth bond and they exchange it with the Federal Reserve dollar for dollar. Now, I don't have any idea what that's all about, uh, how, how, how much it is. It could be $20 million, it could be $300 million, it could be $30 million. I don't care whatever it is, but they exchange it dollar for dollar. Now... The Federal Reserve takes that and they give it to the seating company, the designated nominee for the Deep Depository Trust Company in downtown New York, New York, and they deposit that as evidence of a debt that's owed by whom? By the United States, federal, by the United States and the government. Now, let's say that the Federal Reserve gives, um, uh, gives them $30 million. Well, that $30 million is going to be handed out in tranches to not only the federal side, but the state side where you were born in the state you were born in or the province you were born in. And from there, they will build schools and highways and roads and signs and protect your best interests and all that stuff. And then they will doctors and schools and make sure you're going to be raised up to be a productive citizen of the country from that point they're on in. Now, what's happening is like this is what's going on. But what we have to realize is this, and what Christian spoke about, and I put together my notes on Christian, was this. And Marcus and Sermon King said the same thing. Uh, I'm going to say it this way, we have to, there's a hidden debt on everyone out there, and we have to learn how to reclaim our securities and claim back our right to the property and to do that. Once you redeem your birth certificate to sell that account, you're all taken care of. And that's what I mentioned to you before, Christian, about two, three weeks, two, three weeks ago, was about the 1863 National Bank Act, the 1864 National Bank Act. The same thing that's happening in that act, the 1864, is happening right now with what we're talking about redeeming your birth certificate. And if I may, I'll go like this. Christian and I want to open up a bank. And of course, the 1864 National Bank Act, he said, okay, Okay, Christian, Christian and Bob, you guys can open up, a, open up an association. An association, an association is a bank, an office, or a bank association. We're required to have a certain amount of capital for the, for the population in our area, but we'll make it a little easier to figure at this point in time, say it's $200,000. Well, on top of that, we're also, we're also required to have, of course, the National 1864 National Bank Act, we're required to have, we're required to own the building we're going to operate our business out of. We can't rent or lease it. So we, so Chris and I get together. We have our two hundred thousand dollars capital. We actually own the building, and then we've got the Idols and Corporation. We got the board of directors and officers and all that stuff. All that's taken care of. We got the application for the comptroller of currency in Washington D.C. all ready to go. And then what we have to do is we also have to get 
a bond in the amount of capital that we are required to have by the cost by that's put out laid out by the consular currency. So we go get a two hundred thousand dollar bond and so we pay for that outright for five thousand dollars and we're like that. Now we send our offer application to the consular currency in Washington D C and he goes, Hey Scott, um uh, Scott <laughs> Bob Bob and Chris are pretty cool people. They know what they know they're doing. They got two hundred thousand dollars of capital, they got the bond, they own the bill and stuff. And he approves us for having a, an association or a bank. So there's only two ways that this can go about at this point on any that we know what we're doing in business or we don't know what we're doing in the banking business. And the pro side of this is if we're doing business and 20 years later we go and decide to close down the association or the bank, what happens then is that we, um, at, at the time, by the way, I forgot to say this, that when we're approved by the control of currency to have an uh, association, the contract currency will issue us 90% in value of the bond that we give in various denominational notes to us. Now, 20 years later, when we go to close down the, the association, we're required to hand back the 90, that 90% of notes, which is $180,000 in various denominational notes, back to the contract currency. And we do so. We're all set and we're all taken care of. We can go live our happy life and retire. But here's what's going to happen, people. If Chris and I decide we get to an argument, we don't get along, and we have a really bad couple of years, we don't do very good in business, we're just, we're just, just too inept in taking care of business property, we only have $100,000 when we go around and close down the business, okay? Or we're told to close down the business. Now, the comptroller of currency, what is he going to do? He's going to go back to that insurance company, the broker that gives him a $200,000 bond, and says, hey, Bob and Kristen didn't have uh, the $180,000 that I, that I gave him. Uh, it served them as a courtesy in the very beginning, and they only have 100000 so I'm here to get $80,000 payment for, for this bond. So he takes that bond and cashes in for $80,000. Now that insurance company or broker comes after Christian and I and says, hey, you guys owe us $80,000, and there we go. I'll take it from there. So that's what's going on, people. Now, that was a very quick synopsis. I wanted to see what's going on. But this is an example of what's was, was really happening with Christian and Marcus and Silver King and I have put together what Christian and Marcus have really done themselves. They redeem their birth certificate because their birth certificate is what? A security or a bank note. So what do we have to do, people? We need to get ourselves in some proper order first to show them that we know what the hell we're doing. Then we're going to take our birth certificate and we're going to redeem that birth certificate to the comptroller of currency in Washington, D.C. We're going to tell them we're going to redeem it for all, for the account, that, for, for, for the hidden debt that we don't know that that's on every one of our heads. And that's where the Federal uh, the, the United States Treasury went took that first bond and changed it back to back with the Federal Reserve. And the address of that debt is sitting in the vault at the, in the basement at, at 55 Water Street in New York, New York, at the Depository Trust Company. Now we give, now we redeem that birth certificate. Again, guess what? We sell the debt. Where we go? Now we're like that. Now we can own property. Now we can create our own money. I won't um, give you guys right any more of that. That's uh, the, wait, wait, wait. Let's know what's going on. Well, you know, Bob, that's a, that's a perfect example of how the at-law or the D.C. side is operating now, how they did it. Right. But right. I'm not going to do it that way. Pardon me? I am not going to do it that way. Okay. That's how they have done it in the past. That's how they operate today. Right. They, but I'm not going to use the D.C. land, and I'm not going to use the legal stuff as they use it. I'm not going. I'm going to bypass that. I'm going to stay in equity. I'm going to operate the trust from equity. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with that. But I just do that as, as an example so people can understand and do some research, like you and I have. To put you don't operate that. Way. Don't operate that way, because that that way of operation is full of pitfalls and traps. Oh, I agree with you, but I just was just trying to explain to people so they can understand how they're looking at this. It's nice to know how that was done, but don't do it. Right. Okay, so don't do it, but at least... I don't want to well, redeem anything. It's not redeeming. <laughs> it's merging okay. and extinguishment, termination. Well, I... I I, I realize it because that's what we're all about, merging the extinguishment and ter uh, terminate the trust. Or, uh, yeah, well, not. Oh, yeah. It's all trust stuff, and I didn't hear anything, you know, in legal land that's got to do with the trust. Well, I, again, I just want to say what I said, Chris, to get people to think about what's going on. 
but we can, like you said, we do have a remedy by going through equity to solve this, this situation. I was just getting you, getting people. It's it's good to know not, how that is all being done, so I know what not to do. Right, because a lot of people don't have a clue, even what you said or said about how the first review was taken and monetized or securitized on that stuff. Let alone talk about the 1864 National Bank Act and the 1863 Bank Act. Yeah, because when, yeah. it comes to, when it comes when it comes to the 1863 Bank Act, guess what? Like that guy was just on the phone here. Tom was his name, I think it was. Um, and he was asked to put all that uh, on the um, on the uh, discovery and all that stuff. And then he went through the chain of command and notes like that. Well, I think if Tom went and looked up the 18, and read the 1863 Bank Act, he would have found some very interesting things on there. Yeah, yeah. Bank, find out how they bank, did it. Yeah. You'll find out how they did it. Yeah. What, they, what they stand and can do. Turned it over into legal land, and then they did all this stuff in legal land with it, and you just explained how they did it all in legal land. Right. And see, banks are for being for more money, so what do they do? They trick us into giving, a, they trick us into giving our asset, our property, to them. Uh, well, we Under a general property. deposit. Yeah, we just need to say, you're going here, we'll give you, we'll, you'll be happy to give you a car, car loan. Well, that was a general It wasn't deposit. a general deposit. It was a special deposit, and that's what I got to correct. Right, exactly. That, that's what I'm saying. But that's how the banks got around all the stuff. When you read those two acts and start putting people there, oh, I see what the banks are doing now, and you'll find your answer to your remedy. Created a, a realm to babysit the people because basically everything that they did was for the benefit of the people, and the people are using the benefit. Okay. Because uh, the money is really the human resource that the money is based on, created at the time that they said, okay, we need X amount of dollars to put in circulation to support X amount of people, and that's the the amount that they brought into existence at the time on the actuary table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. And as time went by, the the amount kept on raising, going up and multiplying because they need more and more money to keep it. Uh, but the thing is, it's all held in one pool, the public, and everybody is a beneficiary using it. So they are getting the benefit of it, but you're not you got to look at it as being a trust. And a trust well, is apply different principles than the D.C. realm, U.C.C., actuary tables and stuff and everything that way. Right. And like you said, we haven't claimed the city key trust or the foreign science trust to be a trust in the first place to even give a stand to go in there and claim that. Yeah, that's I, what's what's going on. Until you do that. Okay. Well, listen, I just want to give a quick breakdown like that. I didn't mean to go on this field, but that's just how my research has got me to think like that. I'm not saying that's why we're done, but that was – a plausible way of doing it on the outlaw side if you want to stay on that side. Yeah, so that's how it's done, but trouble is we don't have a license over there to create money and use money. They do. Well, right, exactly. That's what I was telling my, my, my friends I've been talking about saying, because when we go in the bank, we're not licensed, and that's why they can do it, because they can take our property and they can monetize it. As a matter of fact, not only do they monetize it, they fractionalize on it. Yeah, they're your conversion agents. They took your yeah. equitable asset held in special deposit and they created debentures or uh, bonds or whatever you want to call it, derivatives. Yeah. And that's what they're using as money. Yeah, exactly. And that's your... All people's benefit, though, really. But the problem is you got to work for it over there. And that's based right. on a I'll... supply and it's controlled. Right, and that's why I'm trying to get at who... Furnished it all anyway. It's all yours, but the way the licensing is set up over there, you can't touch it unless you work for it. Right, exactly. And but we do have a remedy through equity, and that's why I like what what we're doing, studying like that. And you know, under a private trust, learning how to operate and administer a private trust, and not yeah, do the PC, uh gap stuff. Right. Well, thank you for letting me talk about that. Like I said, a lot of people. Even when they read books, they still can't put a picture in their in their mind as to how it's working. I mean, I took this from about four or five different sources. I'm going, wow, this sort of makes sense to me of what they've done. And you know, that's all. It's just but thanks for letting me talk about that. And maybe some people hear this call and say, hey, I see what this guy's saying. I now I see what I'm not, now I see what I hope what Christian's talking about. 
fixed and how we can get a remedy under equity rather than doing that rather than doing a DC um, move that would still leave us keep us on the uh, DC side at, at law side. So thank you, appreciate that. Right. You are now muted. Okay, hold on. But where is the SOI sold in the currency was transferred to the public? Trusts are the key. Equity is the bouncer. That's what Spook888 is asking right now. But where is the SOI, statement of interest, shown in the currency was transferred to the public? Trusts are the key. Equity is the bouncer. Well, the fact that we're using Federal Reserve notes, that is the evidence. Everybody uses that or credit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just like when it came out with that $1.6 trillion bond back in uh, 2008, you know. All that was was just, that was just evidence of debt. Incredible what they did. Um, And they just take the first certificate, whatever it's uh, per person that they need to put in circulation at that particular time, that's what it's worth, and then they they ledger it. And as soon as they ledger it, that's the account. Yep, and that's where the money was created from was because, like, again, it's like they create the, the birth bond and then they create the birth, short form birth certificate. They took that birth bond and exchanged it with the Federal Reserve. Well, that's what happened in 2008. They created a bond, exchanged it with the Federal Reserve for interest on top of that, and they put it all in the debt. Layer, so layer of account, of, account upon account upon account upon account. Upon account. And what other right. accounts? They're all general accounts. They're not special accounts. But right. all those general accounts are resting on one special deposit. Right, and we claim that. And like you said on the one call, two things. Are, I want to talk about the word prescription again because I heard that in the call yesterday, prescription. And about well, and the thing is, is, is this, you also talked on another call where the people have not, stepped, have not stepped up yet and say, hey, told the president that they want to be independent of the United States and the Queen. Yeah, but they're not independent of equity. They're under the obligation to love one another as themselves. Well, yeah, I, I know that, but I'm just saying in general, though. But again, I, I heard you on the call say the president is waiting for the people to wake up and say, "Hey, we want our independence from Britain, from England," and no one's done that yet. No one's come forth yet. Right, you gotta, and, you gotta act right and act. Yeah, right. yeah. Manifestation of the record. You see, and that's what we were talking about before. When the judge sits down with you or talks to you, like he did to Dan and that other guy, he'll know whether you know what you're talking about and how you handle yourself. It's like, matter of fact, I don't know if anybody knows this, but um, Judge Joe Brown was um, actually had five contempt of courts there the other day, this past week. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah, Judge Joe Brown, after 15 years and was representing a client in court, and they told him at the end that they didn't have time of the day to hear him and him and his client, and he went on a tirade, and even Judge Joe Brown got five contempt of court <laughs> because he didn't handle himself properly. Um, we got a question here, and what is the one special deposit? I think he's referred to what you're talking about there, Chris, and that is you said on the call of January 18, 2010, that one person could pay off all the debts, all the war debts, all the past debts that was owed to the king and queen and all that stuff. Yeah, through one special deposit because all the debts are fictions, fiction debts. Right. But if I may say this, Spook, they can't, they won't, like Kristen has said, they won't, they won't let just anyone do this. They have to know that you know who you are and that you act appropriately. Um, uh, that would cause too much confliction with the public realm. Yeah, um, and that's what you've been talking about, that keeping private. Sleeping. And you don't I'm want both. to, you know, you don't want to jostle the kids because they're not immature. They're not mature yet. Right, exactly. And... Oh, exactly. They're not mature enough yet to do that. And even if, like I said, really, you're 50 you years old. collapse that realm because that's the playpen that they're all being taken care of, or the nursery that they're being brought up, and hopefully they may wake up someday. Right. And that's what I said, they're saying. They're, the, the president's just waiting for the people to wake up and say, hey, we don't, we don't need the queen anymore over our shoulders. Because if you really look at the SEC filing at the DTC, guess what? Both Canada and the United States answer every three months to whom? 
England. Yeah. But you no. can individually. What's that? I say you can individually wake up. Yes, you can individually. That's what operate what your group. Well, that's what your group is really doing is waking up. We just. And then here's the other question. Are all of those fractionalized derivatives from the special deposit of the no trust res or something that stays in the background to them? Hmm. Uh, if you're in the outlaw jurisdiction, they'll see them just as DC contracts, and it'll be the answer that is no. But if you're in equity, equity would say imposing a trust upon everything that was generated from the conversion as trust res. Right, and that's where you come in with draw your general center, redeposit, and special deposit, claim that is your trust res, not their property, and give it back to me. Because under special deposit, a special deposit is a bank deposit of money or other property that is to be used for a specific purpose and must be returned, must be returned to the depositor. Bingo. That's it. That was your signature on that loan that we're not licensed, that Kristen just mentioned here a little while ago, that only these banks are licensed because Chris and I went and got a license from the Comptroller of Currency in Washington, D.C. to have an association, and we're the only ones that are licensed to do that, and because we're licensed, we can take your asset and claim it as ours, and then we monetize it through the Federal Reserve System and fractionalize it as well through the Federal Reserve System, and there we go. Now you're stuck paying for a car or a house in the next 30 years or five years for the vehicle. Hi, sweetie. How are you doing? You come to see me? Oh, good girl. Um, they, okay, okay, okay. And then all of a sudden, you, you're going to take that, you're, you're, you're stuck paying for a car loan for the next five years, and all you have to do is withdraw your general signature, redeposit, and especially deposit, claim that, claim that your asset is yours, and tell them the CFO of the bank applied towards the account. Now you're taken care of. Wow. Or give them another special deposit as a payment. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. You can give them another special deposit as a payment. You can do that too as well. Exactly. Oh, by the way, I'll, uh, next week, you know what I'd like to go over with you, Christian, is coupons and vouchers. I, I think you may have done that before, but I'll tell you what, man. My same friend that's over on the East Coast, uh, we were going through his um, one utility bill, and I'm, I'm looking at the definition of coupon. I don't know if it's coupon or voucher. And I'm telling you, boy, when you look at Black Flag Dictionary, and you look at the definition of what one of those two is, you go, hold on a second. This is saying that this is regarding money for this. So this is regarding the for payment of interest on an account. Well, where's the principal? Where did this principal come from? Whose principal is this? And that's when you start looking up those two words and definitions, people. You start asking questions. Well, hold on a second. Why am I being asked to send a check along with returning this voucher payment payment coupon to the uh, to, to the company? Because like you said, they're just going to take that and put special words or, words or numbers on there and monetize it themselves. Because why? Why am I paying interest on, on this? $115 bill every month? Well, where's this interest? Where, what principle am I paying this on? And that's what they don't tell you, Christian. Okay. Are all these, okay, we, are all these fractionalized religious from the first supply? Well, we've already answered that question. And there's Lisa, so. Anyhow, it's uh, 10.30. Um, I hope to help some people. Need to learn about deposits, Bob. Uh, probably I do. Probably I do. But, you know, again, special deposits and um, coupons and vouchers. Again, get that taken care of later on. I do learn. Take, keep learning. Yeah, I can only take on so much at a time. I got so much on my plate right now, it's not funny. It's never, never, never stops. I was actually up until 4 o'clock this morning. Listening, studying, doing things, and I get an alarm goes off at six. So hey, well, you'll, long... you'll be like Marshall. Yeah, uh, but it's going to be great to know to walk in um, into any situation, be able to handle myself properly and correctly, and not fall into the jurisdiction or giving or granting jurisdiction. I do have to call it a night, folks. I'm in the hot. I'm in the hot bed right now. Hot, uh, hot tub or um, hot coals right now because I should have taking care of some other stuff at the back. Um, All right. Well, it, anything else? Uh, well, just well, Bob, just for you, I'll repost in the NTT group on deposits. Okay. Well. All right. Yeah. Whatever happened to Marshall? The question is being asked. Uh, kind of like. What happens to most people? Really? They think they know more than a teacher. Ah, grasshopper. 
Fly Fly Chain King. <laughs> wasn't that <laughs> wasn't that part of uh right. Uh, right. Kung, Kung Fu? Right. All right. Well this you're welcome there, Spook A. I appreciate that. I'm just glad that we have these calls and that we still got a teacher helpers. I understand all this stuff. I do have to go. Thank you so much. Take care. Have a nice night, people. Bye. Okay, Bob. Thanks for coming on. Okay. One more? Yeah, it's very Christian. It's Chris again. That's, uh, just a clarification because, you know, I was, I was talking about my independent action, and that's the one that has a status hearing coming up. But um, you're saying that I need to also do a motion to compel uh, for oh. hearing on it as well. This is for a case that you had uh, brought forward? Yeah, it's a count. It's basically a countersuit. You talked about countersuing them, so that's what I did. And so now I got a status hearing coming up, and so I I was going to do a default, put in a motion for default judgment, but I'm just more clarification on the independent action against them. You're saying I should also do a motion to compel to answer the complaint, or all right. So this is on a different case, you know. I was giving you an explanation for the. The, the first case that they brought you into court, not the right. I'm in the court. Right. So yeah, that's, that's what. Yeah, exactly. So that's what I want to want to get clarified. So the case that I'm where I'm the the plaintiff against them, and they haven't answered the complaint. What I asked for in the complaint, which was pretty much the same thing I asked for in the defense. So you uh, sent them out a bill in equity, according to, and they haven't answered it. Right. Have you defaulted them? So I put it in the fault judgment then. Well, were they actually served? You went through the court. They they were summoned to answer. Yeah, I uh, I had somebody serving. No, no, no. That doesn't sound like the court. Did the court serve them? Did they send it out the summons? Um, well, I had some. I, I I filed at the court, and then I had to get somebody to, to you know, a servicer to serve them, to serve the, serve the person. So this was through the court. Yes. Well, no, they didn't work for the court, but they served them, and then they wrote after Davidson, and they served them certificate of service and all that, and I put that in the, in the court record. Well, if, if I put it through the court, uh, and they didn't answer it, then I would ask the court clerk to default them on. The judgment for the judgment, and usually the you don't have to go through a judge for that because they didn't answer. Okay. I took a certified copy of the record that shows that there was no answer on the record. I would take that to the clerk, and along with a request to that the clerk default them, because uh, first I have to check in your in your state find out whether you can do that or not, but I think most places can. Okay, you know, okay. The judge, you can just take the NOI and the SOI, the NOI being the claim that they didn't answer and a request to default them, and then the SOI is the record that I just had certified that there was nothing in the record that they answered. NOI, SOI. And then ah, the, would certify the default and, and I would record that and you you won. They didn't answer. You won by default. Okay. All right. That that that, that clarifies that. Okay. Thank you. First, yeah, one more. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do that in your state, though. But I just need to double check my rules. Yeah. Usually, the the clerks can uh, default on a uh, non-response to the main pleading. Like they were ordered to respond in 20 days, and they didn't. Okay. Beautiful. That's, uh, that's absolutely beautiful. I, uh, I was just thinking, he was just talking about, um, I guess it was Bob on, talking about payments. And, you know, with like in the past with like electric bills or maybe gas bills, you sign them and sent them back and and, and sent a self-renewing document like maybe once every year or once every two years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
So in theory, you, in theory, you can do that the same with a credit card. Yeah, you can't have to give the, they agree to it. Yeah. Okay, so it's just a matter if they would agree to it, but same, same, same kind of, uh, same template, I would think. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay. There's more than one way to skin a cat, but yeah, you could do it that way. But like, I guess once a month they would, you know, whatever's been charged on the account, they would just get it from the special deposit, convert it, and, and, and take care of it. Yeah, all this money is converted for the, your welfare benefit and your education, but nobody asks for any amounts that they've standardly set, and they get hit with bills that are more than the standard amount. But nobody asks for an increase of the standard amount. Wow, okay. But you could take care of it your way, or there's other ways, like I just mentioned. Right. So anything else? Yeah, well, I'm still waiting on my uh, Social Security, hypothetically Social Security thing. Um, I don't know if I'm missing some steps or not, but uh, <laughs> so I hadn't heard back from them. So, But kind of preoccupied with some other things right now, so I'll, I'll get back with that, I guess. Well, that's kind of like a show cause. When they don't show up or they don't say anything, then show cause why I should not be able to do such and such. And when they don't say that there's any objections, then the show cause gets granted. Oh, okay. Show cause. That might be the last piece then. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. You know, a response would have to be given. If they didn't respond, then they're in agreement and they're going to waive. And then, so you waiver by a non-response. Yeah, so what did you ask for? Uh, um, uh, withdrawal redeposit. Um, well, they're uh, in agreement with you if they didn't respond. All you got to do is take it to the next step. Okay. So it's kind of like acquiescence how they get get us on the DC contracts and stuff if we don't. If they collect it's good, good for the gander. It works both ways. <laughs> Wow, okay. Again, they're giving you the win on a silver platter. All right. Well, it's just like I just need to pull the trigger, sounds like. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Trigger's already been pulled. All you got to do is record it. (laughs) Okay, yeah, yeah. All right, well. uh, About creating records. All about creating records, right? Okay. Anything else? No, that's it. I'm um I'm I'm pretty excited. I need to get going on this, and uh, I'll give an update uh, next week. Thanks again. All right. Okay, I think we're going to call it a night. So well, thank you all for coming, and we'll see you all next time. Same time, same channels. So everybody have a great week. Night all.